Okay, Mijuxis, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to First Foods. Uh, this uh, class today, this cooking instruction is with Emma Elliott. Um, she is going to be joining us in just a few, but first we're going to do some protocols, uh, starting with Brooke. But Brooke, give me just a second to turn the chimes off here, and I will pull up the um, protocols when you're ready. Uh, so just good day, everybody. My name is Brooke Rodriguez. I'm a Taino mom living in Matinecock Territory in New York, and I'm the host of First Food Classes. We have some housekeeping items to review before we start. Uh, just before we start, Maida is our interpreter. She'll be interpreting in Zoom um, after the showing. So unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties, but we will have a Spanish translation after the showing, we'll have a secondary one. So just to update um, people on that. Um, and also just a minor um, disclaimer, if we have, uh, so First Foods, again, is an edu for educational purposes before using or ingesting any herb or plant or medicinal or for culinary purpose, whatever you wanna use, whatever you see in our, um, either in our website, in our classes or in the group, just make sure that you are seeking a physician, medical herbalist or a suitable professional. And then just a brief introduction to the protocols. Okay, so the first is food sovereignty. First people have the rights to hunt, fish, forage, and harvest in their traditional territories. It is unacceptable to critique traditional or contemporary dietary styles as a non-native. So just really important for anyone who's non-native coming to this space is that we understand and maintain that indigenous people have complete control over how we, put, we mitigate our food systems. So any settler veganism or what's sometimes coined white veganism is not acceptable on this page. Um, we will be discussing meat production and consumption and butchering of those things. And there's a reason for it. A lot of the territories we come from, it's about a relationship to the land. So sometimes things are not in season, sometimes they are. And understanding how to be in a relationship with the land is honestly, you know, you can only get that information from native cultures because we are the cultures that are stemming and birth from these lands. So we know the land and the land knows us. And, you know, we have a, a reason for everything that we do, whether it's either meat consumption or, you know, put planting or, or you know, foraging or, or whatever we have. It's, there's a reason why our cultures are the way they are. And that needs to be respected. We have our own right to govern ourselves and to govern how we eat, what we eat. And, and just, just our food production in, in a whole is only up for non-natives to critique. I mean, only up for natives, not non-natives to critique. It's not your place. Foraging and harvesting. Always seek permission from tribal communities to forage and harvest. These medicines or foods may be seasonal or being left to replenish themselves. Also respect if the answer is no. Again, so it always comes back to whose land are you on? Uh, who's the territory uh, belong to? Who's the original governance? Even if they've been removed, even if they've been mis- uh, you know, misrepresented from time after time or relocated, whose land are you on? Do you have permission to gather? And again, it comes back to our culture. We have a relationship with the land that nobody else does. We know when to harvest, when not to harvest. We have ceremonies, we have spirits that these nations, these plant nations come from. And so that must be respected. And, you know, we have to understand that, that the Americas is occupied territory, you know, and that includes our food systems. So kind of breaching that and creating a, what we call a, you know, a, a pro-colonial perspective and saying, well, I'm going to hunt, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do whatever I want because I bought this land and this mine and, and whatever is pro-colonial and it's not solidarity. Native knowledge. Lessons learned are not for non-natives to monetize on or repackage as their own. Native knowledge systems belong to the cultural communities they come from and to the guest teachers in our programming. Again, it just comes back down to following protocol, you know, following our formalities, uh, respecting indigenous people and the right to have, you know, 
we don't need to have uh, what's called um I forget it. Desiree, what did they call when they do an invention or something like that? And patent? Yeah. We don't need a patent for our our culture and for the ways that we gather and eat food on our lands. We don't need a patent for that. So abusing the fact that we don't typically use patents because it's passed on from generation to generation is just just not it's not solidarity at all. And you don't want to come to a place of disrespect. You don't ever want to be disrespecting native communities in our territories. This is not something you want to do. And, um, you know, just being mindful of those things that native people who are sharing on this site, who are sharing their knowledge are sharing it for indigenous communities and indigenous youth. And so to monetize that or repackage it, and then, you know, not even consult or ask permission is just, it's quite honestly, it's great culture. It's what it is. You're not asking permission. You're not, it's just disrespectful and it's part of rape culture. When you violate someone's information and violate someone's culture and misappropriate it or, or just straight up appropriate it. So it's just something we won't be um, tolerating on this group. Finally, land acknowledgement. We recognize, uphold and respect native nations and their life ways above all else as the ruling governance of Turtle Island. Everyone attending this space must uphold the same. So Native community is very full of formalities and protocols, and this helps maintain respect for other nations, especially being that this is an intertribal space. So for us, when we make a land acknowledgement, we are acknowledging who's, who's the original people and that they are the governance of the territories that we're on. But for non-Natives, um, we're requesting that you do a little bit more than just a statement. It, it has to be more than that. It has to be an ideology, it has to be actions, it has to show in how you organize. It, it just it just does at this point, you know, it's 2020 and it, it the time is, it's, you should have been done that to have those proper actions being done and, and really understanding and honing in on what like land acknowledgement is and it just not be a statement, be something stronger that you really are understanding that you are one a non-Indian or a settler and that you're on stolen land and territories and there have been people and people who still are here from those original territories that are being casted out through erasure culture and through erasure politics. And so every person who makes a conscious effort to say, no, we are on occupied territories. And, you know, this is the community that, that is the representing community of these lands and the original stewards. And these are the people with the original instructions. And I acknowledge that and uphold that. And that makes you a good ally. And that's what we're looking for through these food programs is that it has to be more than this, right? Because we're in a, a situation where the earth is really in a, a catastrophic event, when it, whether with soil or with sicknesses or viruses. And so the only way to really rectify this is to go back to the original instructions. And everybody is a part of that. Everybody has to sit down and say, whose land am I on? Who, you know, what is this place to me? And how am I going to mitigate that? And, you know, how am I going to respect the original instructions? And only people who have the original instructions are the First Nation communities. Those are the only ones. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And that's something so many of us need at this time. So today we have Emma E. Elliott, and I'm just gonna pull up her bio. Uh, Emma, comes from Kiowa, Oleta, Boruka, and Bribi tribes. She's a cultural activist, artist, and school design coach residing in California. She was raised in traditional plant and cultural knowledge and given the privilege to work with elders from across California and Nevada in, in preserving historic cultural sites and knowledge. So she's working on her formal education in archeology span so that she can assist indigenous people with repatriating their historic cultural items, documents, photos, and recordings. In doing this work, she wants to return those relatives home, thus freeing them from a settler colonial cages known as museums or archeological archives. So Brooke, is there any way you'd like to introduce Emma? Otherwise, I will bring her on.
I just want to thank Emma. I think she's a fantastic youth. And I just want to thank her and tell her I'm proud of her and just for being here and, and helping everybody out and showing us you know, some of her medicines. And, and you know, just thank you for being here and thank you for being just who you are. And there, you know, you, I'm proud of you. Hello, everyone. Um uh, uh, um Nashville. Um, my name is Emma, and I am from the Nashville people in California. Um, and today I will be teaching you about um, elderberry flower tea um, and cedar, as well as mugwort or kachina tea. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about was um, taboos, making sure that you're gathering at the right time, um, making sure that you're not under the influence of um, alcohol or any type of um, creational drugs so that you can be in the right mindset to handle these things um, because they are alive and you are taking their lives to um, help your families or helping yourselves or friends or whoever you will be using this knowledge for um, to, um, and then making sure like they um, Rick and Desiree have mentioned that you are contacting your um, knowledge keepers, whether that's your medicine people or um, people around you who work with plants or even your physicians or Western doctors um, for whatever it be, just because um, there can be a lot of harm if um, you use these plants and you're already taking certain medications or you are um, just have other underlying um, problems because they are a type of medicine and they can be really strong and they can affect your body in that way. So um, you just want to be careful. Um, and um, when it comes to gathering, um, making sure, to, <laughs> sorry, gathering in the right areas, um, trying to stay away from the sides of the roads um, where they're spraying with chemicals and things like that. Um, if you're younger, trying to go farther away so that people who um, are older or are elders or struggle um, to walk or move, um, that they can have the closer um, gathering area. So you're trying to go farther away. Um, and there can be penalties if you um, gather on someone else's land without permission and making sure that that's okay because if you, if you do, they are welcome. <clears throat> you are welcome to, they're, sorry, <laughs> they are welcome to take that harvest from you uh, because you are taking that from their families. So very, very important that you get permission. Um, and if you don't know who to ask, um, contacting your local tribe and seeing if they would be okay with those things or who they could connect you with. Or um, maybe maybe um, reaching out to Brooke or um, Desiree after this. They, maybe they have um, some resources for you. Um, and when you gather, making sure that you... Um, give an offering because as I said before you are taking something's life to use for your own and so it's only respectful to give something back and say thank you for that um, something that I use can it can be change like money or it can be tobacco it can be beads that you use for trading um, whatever has a significant value to you um, and because of the work that I do I also want to mention that um, 
a lot of the times when you're walking through trails or forests or um, places that are for the most part untouched, you're probably going to run into artifacts, things like arrowheads or um, just different artifacts. And I please ask you to leave them there um, because they are also alive and they live there and that's where they're supposed to be. And um, when you take them from their home, you're not only putting yourself in danger, but also them. It's confusing and um, you should be able to just let them be where they are. So now um, I think I've been speaking about what we're doing today. Uh, in my area right now, um, the elderberry plants are just beginning to blossom. So we don't quite have berries, um, but we do have elderberry flowers. Let's see if we can see um, them. So they have these small yellow flowers and the leaves are thin, mm, hard to see. Thin and <laughs> sharp on the edges, but um, when you use the flowers, it is for um, for sinus issues. At least that's what my family uses it for. Um, and it's not to get rid of sinus problems, um, but just to relieve um, some of the problems that come with that. Um, so what you're going to do is separate the flowers from the stems. Um, because the stems can be poisonous as well as the leaves. So you don't want um, those to be mixed in. Um, okay. And then I like to wash them off just to be careful of bugs that could be in there or something otherwise. And then I'd say you could use about a tablespoon or two of um, a tablespoon or two of the flowers and one cup of water and you can put that on the stove for about 15 minutes so it can soup. Um, I'll turn everything on now. Um, let's see if I can move this closer. I do. Okay. Oh, oh no. Camera's fine. Okay, let's see. So I'm actually sharing the elder blow elderberry flower tea that Emma is talking about right now. So I'll go through and as she's making this or maybe at the end, I will share this again in case folks want to look at the recipe. So here you can see the things that are going in that she's gonna show us and I'll share the recipe again after. So, um, all I did was add the elderberry flowers and water into a pan and then I put that on medium high heat and then let it simmer for 15 minutes um, and then all the recipes are pretty similar um, so the next one would be um, cedar um, so I have flat cedar in my area right now um, and that is what I used for this tea. Um, the cedar um, should not be brown or yellow when you gather it. Um, it. It has to be fresh, otherwise it's just not gonna work the same way or it could make you really sick. Um, so you just strip, you just strip the cedar from the main stem and separate it out. Um, I'd say use about two, um, two full stems like this for your tea. 
um, and then do the same thing. You could steep it for uh, about 15 minutes and that should be uh, strong enough for your teeth. Uh, and fair warning, it's not gonna taste very good. Um, it's gonna be pretty strong, like drinking cough syrup or something like that. Um, something you could do is add honey or a natural sweetener. Um, I would prefer to use natural sweeteners if you were trying to make this um, an herbal remedy, sugar, Processed sugar is really not good for um, your body, and it doesn't, it, if anything, limits the um, feeling that it's going to do for your body. Um, something I forgot to talk about is how to tell when elderberries are ready, um, because the flowers look a lot different than the berries. Um, and when they are ready, they'll be small and purple or dark blue and have like a white coating around them. Um, people can describe it as frosted. And that's how you know they're ready to gather. Again, when you are using those, please do not use the stems or the leaves because they are poisonous. Um, if you are collecting them when they, gathering them when they're not ready, they can cause you to get really bad stomach problems and diarrhea and things like that so you have to be really careful and that's why it's important and <laughs> that's why it's important to um, make sure you're reaching out to those knowledge keepers so that they can teach you what you're looking for when you find a plant making sure that you're using the wrong plants or that you're over gathering um, they have a lot of lessons to learn before it's not as easy as just going out and saying like like, I think that's the plant. I'm going to gather it um, because that can be really dangerous. So as you cook your tea for the altaberry, it'll turn yellow. Um, you want a pretty dark yellow tea. Um, and then the last tea that I'm going to make is mugwort or wormwood. Um, in my language, we call it kachina. Um, and this is kind of like my version of sage in my area. Um, and it's important to be using the plants in your area and not using plants that are already um, overgathered, like white sage is overly used when there are lots of other things that have the same. Um, sorry, the same. Um, health benefits, some things like cedar and kachina, um, they all do the same thing that sage would, and then you're also respecting those people and their medicine without overusing it. So I'm going to share the um, recipe for the mugwort tea of Emma's. As you can see, it has the disclaimer on the top. Um, this is uh, again, something that I'll share towards the very end, but this is the mugwort tea Emma is making for us right now. So for right now, if you are going to use um, these teas for people in your family um, or people outside of it, it's very, very important to make sure that you are um, keeping everything clean and sanitized before you start the process, making sure that you're wearing masks and gloves while you do it. Um, especially if you're giving it to someone else other than your family members. Um, right now, it's a really dangerous time and you wanna be as careful as possible and make sure you're washing your hands multiple times while you cook. And um, you can visit the CDC website and they can tell you the proper ways to sanitize so that you're ensuring their safety as well as yours. Um, so next um, something that I always do, and I did this before we started the video, is smudging off your workspace as well and the items that you're going to use to make the medicine. Um, where I live, we have Angelica root. Um, so it looks like this. 
and that's what I use to smudge off. Um, I actually gather it here, uh, which can be really dangerous <laughs> because it tends to grow on the sides of the hills, by highways or roads, um, and it's always rude to see someone <laughs> on the side of the road digging in the ground. And um, I actually recently went to gather some more because we were, my family was getting low and <laughs> a cop actually pulled up and questioned me really aggressively, asking what I was doing, um, kind of invalidating that this is something that you can do anymore. I kind of responded like I was crazy <laughs> for doing this. And I could, I probably looked a little bit crazy because I was holding like a four foot pickaxe. So I mean, that could be kind of intimidating <laughs> to an officer. Um, but that's kind of the dangers that come with gathering is, you know, a lot of the towns and people don't know that there are people that care that still use these resources and they won't really respect you for it. Um, I definitely heard of people accidentally going on private property when it was the land that their grandmothers used or their parents used and being arrested for those things. So it is really dangerous. And that's also another reason why it's important to ask your knowledge keepers um, about what areas you should gather in because they can give you that advice where it's like, this is property that we know. And also maybe stepping out of your boundaries and asking um, if you see a plant that you want to gather from, but it is on someone's area, you know, maybe talking to them, going and knock on their door and explaining yourself and explaining what you're doing. Um, the work that I do right now with the school district, we've actually reached out to a lot of people in, in the area um, about um, reaching out to those people so that we can gather, so our students can gather in those areas without having to risk um, their safety. And they've actually been really open and they start making maps of their land and saying, yes, please can gather. We want to learn about those things. And so just reaching out to them can be really good um, and open new areas for yourself and your family if you already gather. Um, but I think now, let's see if you can see it's bright yellow, um, kind of like if you mix water with turmeric, and um, you want to keep it on a rolling boil for 15 minutes, and um, making sure that the longer you cook it, the more concentrated um, the medicine will be. So. Um, you just want to be careful about that um, and figuring out what works best for you, what strength works best for you, how much you should be drinking. Those are also really good questions to ask your knowledge keepers um, because they have experience with these things and they can probably tell you that you should probably use this much or it might be something that you have to figure out on your own. Like start with smaller portions before you drink the whole cup of tea. Um, I myself would say that it'd be safe to drink any of these teas um, once or twice a day. Um, they, with respect and trying not to over harvest, but. Um, so Emma, I have a question. Yes. Do you, and I'll actually set the settings here so that people can unmute themselves and we'll do so, a little bit of question and answer with Emma while we're waiting for the tea to steep. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself. But um, my question is, do you know any stories about the plants that you're working with? Like how they got their properties or? Do you know any stories about your um, I don't. That's a really good question, and uh, that's something I definitely want to look more into. I do not know um, where they came from specifically or if there's any stories behind them. Um, this is just what I've been taught growing up by um, the elders who were around me and my family. Um, but I, I believe that... Um, at least what's been taught to me is that they all um, were here first, the plants and animals before us. 
and um, I actually believe the Angkor or kitchen nut um, is also used in Asia, as well as the um, elderberries are used in Europe and Asia. So I think that it's they've been medicinal, had a lot of medicinal properties throughout um, the world. And that, that's about all I know about them. You have a question from the comments from Laura, who's asking, are you cooking cedar in the pot? Um, I am not. I don't have a lot of little pots, unfortunately. Um, but if I did, I would yeah, just cook it in the pot the same. You could also get um, cheesecloths and put the plants inside of the cheesecloth and tie it up and put it in the pot so that you don't have to strain it. Um, or you can use, they have like tea, um, spoons where they're like a little cage and you can put, um, loose flowers inside of that too. Oh yes, it's el elderberry flower. Sorry. I didn't, um, clarify that. Uh, it's just the elder flowers inside of the pot right now. Um, and it's a bit more soft. It's just about that. So I'm going to get. So folks following along who just joined can um, be up to speed. I'm sharing the elderberry flower tea that Emma is showing us how to cook right now. Um, this is the recipe. And um, when it's ready, she's going to talk to us about maybe, I don't know, how do you consume it? Uh, do you strain it? Do you drink it just like that? But this is the, the recipe. I'll share this and uh, two others that Emma submitted into the group after the class today. So we'll go back to Emma, but this is the recipe. Uh -huh. So what I generally do is I take a strainer and like this, or there are smaller ones. Um, it's more of a I'd call it a sift, so I do a lot of baking, so it's a sift to me, a little um, smaller holes, so that um, flour or cedar or whatever you use doesn't get in it, um, and then you just pour the tea through. I did not make very much, um, because I wanted it to be stronger, because you could always do less sugar to make concentrate and then just add more water. So it's a little hard to see, but it's pretty dark. Golden flower. Um I got a question from <laughs> what does the oh went off the screen. What does the flower tea taste like and why a simmer instead of a um the um, I have been taught to simmer it because it pulls the oils from it already and because um, it's not dried. My, the flowers I had, um, I gathered a couple of days ago and so um, it allows to slowly get the oils out of the flower um, instead of steeping it. If you steep it, um, it releases it too much or you might not get enough um, of the plant oils out of it. So I have um, this tea now and I would generally mix it with water or add a sweetener. Um, all of these teas are going to be pretty strong tasting. <laughs> They're not, um, depending on your palate, they might taste good <laughs> to you, um, but I definitely I would add a sweetener to it, a natural one. Um, That's uh, crazy. Do you want me to share the cedar tea graphic that you submitted and we can talk about cedar tea a little bit? Sure. Okay. So here's the cedar tree, cedar tea uh, recipe. One of the things that Emma had 
of is that cedar should never be yellow or brown. It should be fresh and green. So I know that there was a question about what pot it could be. So this class, she's making elderberry flower tea. So this is one of the things that we'll share in the Facebook group as well. So the cedar tea, um, I use it for um, your throat is a cough or your throat is sore, um, it relieves the um, soreness. Again, it's not to get rid of the cough, it's just relief. relief. Um, in my tribe, the singers use the cedar tea um, to relieve their throats when they are sore from singing um, because generally our ceremonies last about four days or longer, and they'll be singing for like three hours on end um, multiple times throughout the day, and that can get really tiring for your throat. So um, they use the cedar tea for that. Um, um, it's mainly used in the winter because it's an evergreen, so the um, cedar will still be green. It's one of the like plants that is easiest to find during the winter and it helps um, your immune system up and relieve the common colds that you get during the winter. So adding about two stalks of this um, cedar uh, into the pot and I will do the same thing, put it on the rolling boil for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, cedar can also be used for cleansing. Um, it has, um, it has, sorry, trying to read chess and keep healthy. Um, it has medicinal properties for cleaning, it's antibacterial. So <clears throat> that's why it, similar to the sage, um, it cleans the air. Um, and I think um, it's great that we can research those things because it just shows how um, the ancestors in the past knew what they were doing and that they would use them to smudge and clean the air from bad spirits, but also um, it's getting rid of germs and things like that. Um, Emma, I have a question. I'm sorry I keep asking all the questions. I just have a no, lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> what um what kind of cleaning products can you make with cedar that seems like it's non-toxic and so that seems like a pretty good cleaning product because we don't want to poison the environment really well. um i'd say you could use this solution once it's concentrated and mix it with water and um use it as a natural cleaner um but it definitely Sorry, chat. Um, it definitely won't um, be as strong as if using antibacterial. At a time like this, I wouldn't use it um, to keep things 100% clean. Um, but yeah, I believe that those are the ways that you can use it for cleansing. Or um, when we make our acorn mush, we also use it um, as. Um, in a cleansing way for that, we put it in the acorn as it's being processed um, so that we can um, cleanse it. It also helps with the um, acidity and for some reason it makes it taste better. Um, but you can also just bring the cedar in your house like sage, um, dry or wet. Um, and that cleanses, cleanses the air. And then I got another question in Nevada. Um, they were asking about Kachina um, and it does, <laughs> you do have Kachina in Nevada um, and it grows in the canals. Something you could also use a sage is the sagebrush, um, which is very plentiful in Nevada. And um, the, you can also make teas out of that, but it has to be dried. It, you can't pick it fresh. Um, Something else. What else do I know? 
Shepherds in Nevada. Mm -hmm. I would say those two things are the closest to stage that you have is the Kachina um, and the sagebrush there. And then for this tea, um, Spark had asked earlier, this tea you can steep um, with hot water, but I would say it takes longer than uh, your normal tea and it would still have to steep for just as long. So you'd want to have your water really hot before you um, steep it. And you could either use, again, the, the tea um, little baskets or um, your strainer, you could put it in your strainer and set it over the pot of hot water. You could, or you could just put it into the water and then strain it out once it's done cooking, I think. There we go. Um, let's see what else can I show Someone's commenting in the chat that it must smell so good in your house right now. Yeah, it does. Surprisingly, the cedar is not that strong. Um, Right now, I think it's just because it's fresh rather than um, dried. But yeah, it does smell really good <laughs> between burning the angelica and then having the cedar and the kachina. It smells good. Um, so can we use dried cedar or does it need to be fresh? Because what if somebody sends you some cedar and then it's dried on the way before you receive it? Um, you wouldn't want to use the dried cedar for the elderberry flowers. You could dry them. Um, I wouldn't use the cedar um, when it's dried for the tea, but you can definitely still use it for cleaning, um, cleansing, like burning. Um, but yeah, usually there, um, there's a lot of cedar in the mountains, but I could understand that. I'm not sure how you would keep it fresh if you were to nail it. Maybe if you, I don't know if this would make the box wet, but maybe you could take like a paper towel and soak it and then roll it up and then put it in another towel and then send it and it might stay fresh that way. Um, I haven't tried that though. That's just a guess. <laughs> maybe I'll have to try it and see if that works. Yeah, that's a good idea. I, you know, I pick up cedar, but then I wind up with extra and I wind up burning it because um, I don't know if folks on this call have ever smelled it. Maybe some of you have, but cedar when it's burning has a really beautiful, fragrant, uh, sweet smell to it that um, can really, you know, help just how you're feeling sometimes. And so I'm trying to figure out what can I do with my extra now dried cedar. So I see that my mom is answering a lot of questions in the tribe. Maybe, I don't know if she'd be allowed to jump on, answer more questions. What, you your mom wants to jump on? Yeah, I think so. That would be great. Wait a second, let me go find her. Okay. <laughs> her mom, is a, a Miwok culture bearer who is from my people. Uh, she's really been able to um, really bring up a really beautiful group of young women who are finding their center through learning culture. So, oh, here she goes. Hey, hey, unmute, Ubi. Hi, Majuxis. Hey, Majuxis. So, could she, Emma, good job. Um, I know we just want to maybe all take a minute and say a big O for Emma for taking this step and, you know, showing herself and, mm -hmm. and the things that she's learned. I just really want to commend her for that. Um, <laughs> she's, she's done a great job doing this. In it, uh, Desiree's question, um, a lot of tribes that have sweats, use the dried cedar. So it's a horrible way to describe it, but um, if you went into a tobacco or a pipe shop, they have grinders and you can grind up the cedar by a grinder and powder it 
and hold it in mason jars and ship it. Oftentimes when we um, freeze medicine or keep it cold, it loses its, its properties. So even when we process elderberry, there's a time frame. That's why we don't gather too much. We take only enough that we know we can work that plant and that medicine. And then um, going back to the chat about <laughs> um, Gardner, no, Gardnerville, Nevada, mugwort isn't naturally occurring there. It was brought in and planted um, on the res there and it, it grows okay. But out in Woodford's, when you come to the California and the Sierra Nevada side, it grows plentiful in your canals. Again, keep in mind for anyone in that area that may not be from there, always ask permission and acknowledge the people and, you know, follow those protocols that were put in place. Um, and just a thank you to Brooke and Desiree and to the sponsor who put this forward. I'm not sure what she wanted me to answer, but I'm here to watch and help. I know she was going to get into the Kachina. And again, with <laughs> identifying Kachina, for us, you have mugwort and you have wormwood and you have varying species of that that grow in our region. So most often people misidentify the plants. So it's really important to know your plants. And one thing that Emma didn't get to talk about is <laughs> not all of us were meant to be plant people. You know, in indigenous communities, everybody had purpose. So maybe you were the basket maker, maker. maybe you were the singer, maybe you were the, the dreamer, the special person. So it is okay to acknowledge that and to keep those places for those knowledge keepers. Maybe it means you know, you get get your your tinctures or your medicines at the co-op, or maybe you feed your knowledge keeper. You bring them wood, you bring them food, you make sure they have heat and water and all of those good things. And your knowledge keeper may then share things with you. So, you know, it's it's one of those things we we get in such a we get in such a consumption mind in society, we want to be able to do it all, but we have to acknowledge the natural gifts that people were given. And the other part that we've seen being in COVID-19, just like going to the, the store um, and all the toilet paper is gone and all the Clorox wipes, it's the same in traditional harvesting. So you only take what you need. And when you harvest from a plant, you're obligating yourself to it. You're gonna go back to it. You're gonna take care of it. You're gonna make sure it's okay. And you're gonna you're gonna commit to it, you know? And and that's why you hear some people say, well, I'm not telling you where that is because it is a commitment to harvest every year to go back to watch through a fire that may come through the land. And what we're seeing is, is we went to gather the elderberry flowers this year, the world's sick right now. And last year we had a really light harvest of elderberries, but every tree I'm seeing is blooming early with lots of flowers, meaning there's gonna be lots of, lots of fruit, which <clears throat> for me looks like the world's trying to heal itself. And so I think this is a time for us to think as a community in the whole world, to think about our consumption, to think about, well, if I'm privileged enough to sit at home and telecommute, what in my family can I share with the neighbors who has to go work every day, who has to leave their children at childcare and just take things from a new perspective. Um, the other part that Emma didn't get to touch on was this virus is a real thing. And so if you're preparing medicines right now in these teas, you should only prepare them for those in your household. And even when preparing for things in your household, for people in your household, you should be wearing masks and gloves. You know, it's just another precaution because this is medicine. If I have a positive case and I sneeze into the tea, 
and I feed the tea to my children, I've just transmitted the virus. You know, it's a very real thing that we have to be aware of, even in our food consumption at home. If I've got a sinus infection and I take a taste of the food and put the spoon back in the food, you know, I, I'm transmitting it. And so that's something that we've prepared for in our house because Emma's going wants to share this medicine when she makes her final batch, she'll be masked, she'll be gloved, it'll all be aseptic, and she'll take all of those precautions. So I think that's what I have. Maybe we can jump back to Emma if she's okay. Sure. Thank you so much for sharing that, just by the way, Elizabeth. Um, I think it's really important that folks understand that, you know, um, young people in the community are brought up <clears throat> by culture keepers such as yourself. So I just really appreciate you just speaking. So, you know, just straight to the point and just letting us know stuff that needs to be said. And it's really cool just to have you and your daughter on First Foods. Um, I see that Emma is back up. Are you ready, Emma, to do the, uh, the final parts of your tea? As she gets ready, um, I think there's a there's question. The question about bare root, again, because that's not specific to, to our region, I would lean to a culture keeper in that area where it grows. Uh, so just speaking with bare root, if you watched our first class with Linda Black Elk, that was one of the medicines that she was very afraid to share because of over harvesting. So I would say leave it alone. Um, if it's not from your community, uh, and this is for non-natives and also intertribal protocol, leave it alone. Or like Emma said earlier, uh, she gave us a very detailed way of how to look for approval if we can harvest something. Uh, Emma said go to the medicine keepers, the knowledge bearers, the, um, the council from those communities and acts. But white sage and bear root, if you can find something else, I would say allow those plants to flourish for the communities that have traditionally held them and been in relationship with them. Yes, it was for bare root and also white sage. There's a lot of plants that are being over harvested, but those are like the two main ones that are, are kind of like reoccurring and things like that. So white sage, bare root, and some other things you want to allow the traditional territories that still really use that because a lot of the times there's a really big disconnect especially with city folk of how res or rural life is and sometimes this is their mode of food and commodity and they don't have you know a, a, a next door walmart it might be in like three four five hours away you know so we have to understand that traditional communities really still a lot of them still have a very strong connection with land harvesting so you also don't want to disrupt that uh, especially if you're um, uh, privileged in a way that you're able to get other items that are just as beneficial or medicinal that was one of Linda Black Elk's big take backs and I think um, uh, we'll we'll put it definitely back up uh, and show it to you so that you can kind of see about through an ethnobotanist. But again, what Emma was saying, Emma was straight to the point. Find your medicine keepers, ask permission, be respectful, and know the knowledge of the plant, you know? So yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, so we'll go back to Emma. So I um, had already strained the same thing that I did with the elderberry flowers is you just strain um, your tea through into your cup. Um, so this is the cedar tea. Um, it's a pretty bright yellow. Um, and then I put um, the kachina um, or wormwood into um, the pot with a cup of water. Um, it really depends on how strong you're trying to make the tea, um, where the amount of water to um, the amount of medicine that you add in. Um, in the recipes that I shared, those are very general um, <clears throat> amounts, but it will depend on 
you're trying to make it more concentrated, don't cook it longer, or add more. Um, it just really depends on what you um, are trying to do. Something I didn't mention was um, the elderberry tea. Once you make it, um, you want to drink it within three hours of making it. As for the kachina, um, <clears throat> you can store it in the fridge for about a day or two, and um, then you would want to throw it out. Um, and then the cedar tea, you want to drink immediately. Um, you wouldn't want to have it out more than an hour. Uh, and that's where these are different than normal teas that you would buy at the store. They're natural and they don't have preservatives, so they're not going to last quite as long. Um, so you really just want to make it when you're ready to use, ready to use it. Um, Emma, could you tell us, like, it looks like you have that tea on a really fast boil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, so I put it on about medium high heat. And then I let it get to a <laughs> a boiling boil, and then I turned it down to simmer. So it's a simmering um, on the stove at the moment. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. I have a question. Can you yeah. ferment it like they do with the? Uh, I know a lot, like a lot of. I don't know how it's called, but like kombucha, is that the name of it? Oh, kombucha, yeah. No. Um, elderberry kombucha? <laughs> um, you wouldn't want it to be fermented, especially with elderberries. If you did elderberries and you tried to ferment them, it'd most likely just turn into alcohol and it also have, it would have a lot of bacteria. It's just not very safe um, to do at home. I'm sure maybe there would be a way if you um, got really into it, but I'd say um, if that's not your profession, it'd be really um, dangerous to do so. There's just too many um, things that could go wrong, whether it's turning it into alcohol or bacteria or um, it going bad in between you trying to do so. But something you could do instead is make elderberry syrup. Um, instead. And then that you can store for a long period of time and it has the same um, health qualities. Oh, something my mom wanted to share is that um, for the mugwort tea, you wouldn't want to have um, people who are pregnant um, drink the teas. Um, it's not good for them could also possibly cause them to go into labor. So this is another reason why you would want to um, check in with a doctor or a knowledge keeper because there might be underlying problems that can make these teas really dangerous for you or medications that you're taking that could make these dangerous for you. So you just want to be really careful with that. So, say this tea has been boiling um while you guys are having a conversation with my mom um so it's almost done um Desiree was there something that you wanted me to touch on touch on after the teas were done around all my friends um well there is a question from and sorry it's okay she asks, do milk have traditions around alcohol? My friend who's from a tribe in Arizona does ceremony where they make wine from a cactus fruit. Um, I am not aware of any ceremonies that we do with alcohol. Um, I know there were certain kinds of sort of alcohol that we would make, um, but I, I don't believe um, I haven't heard of any ceremonies being done with alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this tea is about done. So I'm going to do the same thing and strain it through. Um, and 
then all of our teeth will be done. And that did not take quite as long as I thought it was going to. So that's fine. And this tea is sort of brown, orange color, and it smells amazing. <laughs> so, so that is, and that will be all the teas that I made. So it does look really similar um, to the cedar tea. The cedar tea is more of like a red orange, whereas um, the Bogor tea is a yellow, really light orange. Um, and then this is the elderflower tea. And um, would you go over for us what some of the uh, benefits are of the three teas that you've made? Like, remind me what um, the mugwort tea is good for? Um, the mugwort tea, um, I believe, is good for the immune system, too, um, as well as um, sore throats and coughs, um, similar to the cedar tea. Um, and then the cedar tea is also good for coughs and sore throats um, to relieve them. And then <clears throat> the um, elderflower is good for sinus problems um, as well as a good immunity booster, um, but not, not as great as like the pure elderberries. And you said so um, you would add a sweetener into some of those. What sweetener would you recommend? Um, I would recommend normally what I do is I get oh, I get um, honey from your local area. Um, it should be um, natural honey made from either the wildflowers or um, flowers in your area because when you use it locally, um, it can also help with your allergies and your immune system because it has the pollen from the plants that are around you. So it's just kind of a double boost and it's sweet so it helps sweeten your teas. Um, while also adding that extra um, immunity um, that's what I would use. You could also use agave, that's a natural sweetener, um, or natural maple syrup, not like um, maple syrup. Maybe you would buy at the grocery store. It's like $2. <laughs> you would want to use something more natural so it, it doesn't add um, those processed sugars in them because um, then it just defeats the, the purpose of the medicine. I'd say it makes it not as strong. Um, so those are a couple of things that I would use to sweeten it. Mm -hmm. um, or you can just water it down a lot if that makes it easier, but then there's gonna be more for you to drink. So you just have to endure it a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go ahead and share to the screen again, the three recipes in a row for the folks who might be taking notes and want to just read the recipes. So first we have the mugwort tea, which is one half cup of mugwort, three to five cups hot or cold water, using a tea bag or a strainer, as we saw with Emma, uh, with the saucepan. And I believe, and Emma, just correct me if I'm wrong, that you let it uh, cook on the in the saucepan about 15 minutes for each yeah, of these. That, that's correct. Mm -hmm. and then the next one is the elderberry flower tea, which is one fourth cup elder flowers with no stems and no unripe berries. The berries, she said, when you're looking for them, they have like a white, they're frosted looking when they're ready. So for this tea, you take two to three cups of hot water in the saucepan, again, 15 minutes, and put it through to a strainer. This is another one that you're gonna wanna consult a knowledge keeper and physician before use. 
And then finally is the cedar tea, which is one cup stripped cedar leaves, again, fresh, not brown or yellow and not dried, <laughs> two to three cups of water in the saucepan, and then use one tea bag or tea steeper. So you would cook that or uh, boil it for 15 minutes. And that's how you get these three wonderful, fragrant, uh, healthy, natural teas. So we're gonna go back to Emma, um, maybe to let us know anything else about these teas and then we'll go back into Q and A. Um, I think I mentioned about everything. Um, so just to go back, um, the cedar is normally good in season for winter, but it's also good right now. Um, but it's usually used in the winter. Um, the kachina is growing right now, um, but it's best to gather um, the kachina in the beginning, um, early spring, because by summer it usually starts to bud. And when it's budding or having flowers on it, you don't really want to use it at that point. Um, for the elder flowers right now um, in my area near <clears throat> near Ukaya, um and Lake Fork and Inkler Lake, um, they're all um, budding early. Usually it'd be about now that they would just start, um, but they're all flowers and they're starting to turn into berries. So that's a really early season, um, which I think is amazing. It kind of shows how um, the world knows that we're in a place where we need this medicine right now. And um, I'm just really thankful for that. So the flowers are right in season right now and the berries are starting. The berries should be um, in season in the summer, um, but just to be careful, because that is when snakes start coming out and you want to be careful about the times that you gather so that you can keep you and your family safe. Um, but I think that would be all I'd have to say about the, the seasons for these plants. Where uh, they so Emma, I just wanted to um, ask you, because I know that you're really into youth um, organizations and organizing. Do you guys get together for like tea time? <laughs> the students and I? Mm -hmm. Was that a question? Wait, sorry, could you say that again? Well, just talk about how the youth and you gather and if you guys get together for tea time or foraging or anything like that. Like, just talk a little bit about you know, how that, um, mm -hmm. how, how this is helping you guys as a community kind of just reroute and reconnect. Yeah. Um, in general, I think it's really important for the youth and um, the communities to start learning about um, the medicinal properties um, and plants that they have around them um, so that they don't feel like there's a loss. It, it kind of connects you more to the land that you're <clears throat> that you're on because it connects you to the medicine that grows there and you see more and more things from that. Sorry, my sister <laughs> is coming. Um, but the, the work that I do with the youth right now um, is through the big picture, um, big picture learning Native American initiative. Um, we do have a website. I did share the links with Desiree and Brooke. Um, and it's a so the original program is a national education program from um, <clears throat> all over. They're in California, they're in Africa, in New Zealand. So they're really spread out. Um, and it's only been a few years now that we've had the Native American program. Um, and so we're still in the beginning stages, trying to get more grants and more things so that we can support more students and connect with them more. Um, right now, it's just been getting to know the schools and getting to know the youth and having them come through with us and understanding what um, we're trying to do and help them with. Um, but our plans for this year is actually to start doing that, to being able to take them out on more field trips into their area and see where they come from and what the land is like here. Um, we're also working on making botanical gardens and medicine gardens, trying to 
um, grow traditional foods because that is also really important. I'd say just eating traditional foods um, that are healthy for you, that would be in season, um, can make just as much as an impact as some of these teas that I've made today. Um, because the seasons that they're in, they're made um, for those times. So um, that's what we're doing right now. But well, not right now. That's what we were doing in the past and what we're trying to do in the future once things open back up. But um, it's a little difficult for our program at the moment because it's all based around being together like a family. And <laughs> right now we can't do that. We're trying to keep them safe. So, but those are some of our plans for the future. Um, and also getting community outreach, making sure that um, those students and those people know like where their communities are from or where their tribes are from. And also knowing that people in the community do care for them and can help them and bringing out those mentorships of whether it's um, a medicine keeper or otherwise, because there's lots of things that you can do in the native community. And so it's just connecting, reconnecting um, those people with each other because I feel like from everything that's happened in the past, we've been so distanced from each other and feel like we're all just trying to survive this and we've forgotten how to live and just enjoy life um, here and <clears throat> going back to our roots and seeing why we live, outlived everything, why we're still here and why um, our culture was so strong and getting that back. Um, when it was almost stripped away from us or for some tribes completely stripped away. So I'm really thankful for what you guys are doing, Desiree and Brooke. Um, I think it, this is really important. And I know that there are some views that um, these aren't things to be shared to the internet um, or that, um, you know, that you have to be in a certain place to learn those things and, and that's true but it's also um at this point you know we're losing a lot of the elders we're losing a lot of people who have this knowledge and um, although it's not traditional for us to write these things down or to record them um it needs to happen so that we are in a respectful way so that we are able to keep these things um especially with the work that i do for archaeology and the things that i've been learning from the tribes is that um, you know, unfortunately, even my generation or past generations are a little too stubborn to change their ways, and that's understandable with everything that's happened, but I do think it's important to step outside of yourself and say, maybe even if it's not my kids who want to learn, but someone else's kids or um, someone they meet outside if they're willing, if they're willing to respect um, those things and those those teachings, then I think it's really important for them to learn, regardless of who they are, um, Native or not. This is something that, even though these are my teachings from being Native American, they've been doing everywhere. Like I said, in Asia, in Europe, they all have um, their own medicine and their own way to do these things. And so um, it's just connecting that on a deeper level, rather than just saying, like, these are mine. And I'm not going to share them, and then that's how things get lost. So I want to make sure. Can you say hi? <laughs> you can't see you're in the sun. Okay. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, those, um, I see. Uh, so we have three comments from the group. Uh, one was a little bit earlier on at 744. Sorry, Melanie, we didn't see you. But she said, I am from Gardnerville, New uh, what is that? NV? I'm awful. I don't know my state. Nevada. 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 <laughs> oh, yeah. Leah was born there. I should know that. I'm sorry. Oh, and we have several types of sage that I know, but I am unsure if there is mugwort in our willow gathering area. It seems to be popping up in areas I didn't see them in before. Can you help me identify it? It is green on top and silver on the other side. So I'm guessing um, maybe we mm -hmm. could just throw up a picture of what it looks like or yeah. I get kind of leery with um, silver identification like that, so just be careful yeah. in identifying. But yeah, Emma, you go. 
yeah, I'd say it, it's still definitely a thing you should run across, not just um, basing it off this video, because um, it is hard to tell. And there are um, different kinds depending on the area that you're in. So it could be the same plant, but it's going to look different. Um, but yeah, um, they do have mugwort there. Um, and it's not, as my mom had said before, um, we spoke a little bit about that. It's not indigenous to that area. Um, it was brought over. Also, like the sagebrush there's, that's there, it's not indigenous to that area. Um, but they used it once it started to grow there. Um, and the mud port, it is silver and then green on top. Um, and something that my mom mentioned. Oh, sorry. Can we see the one you were holding up just now? Uh, yeah, it's kind of, the one I have here is, it's not so silver, it's just kind of like light green and then darker green on the top. And it usually has the five spikes. There's one, two, three, and it's hard to see, four and five. Um, and that's just the leaf, but they usually grow between, depends on your area, like I would say about two feet to three feet. Um, but also if um, you don't feel confident in gathering these things, they do have them at stores. They do have the elderberry tea, the elderberry syrups. Um, and sometimes that can be better, especially if you don't know your area or you aren't able to get a hold of those knowledge keepers rather than trying to go by yourself. Um, just using the ones that they have at the store. I know in the co-op in town that they have um, cedar, they also have elderberries. Um, dried ones for right now so maybe taking advantage of that um, and maybe hopefully in the future it can change that they like would get that from us so it can stay with the people first and then the rest can go but for now yeah I'd, I'd say um, if you're not confident in knowing what it looks like I would just go to the store and buy it if possible in, instead of risking um, possibly getting this the wrong plant. Um, I wouldn't want anyone to get sick. Mm -hmm. We've actually um, warned folks on these calls, though, not to purchase white sage and things like that, yeah. like those types of medicines in the store. So it's really important to notice across Linda and Isaac and Emma um, the explanations that are like mugwort is in your environment and it's not threatened. You don't have to go buy it in Whole Foods, you know, yeah. so learn to identify them. But there are places like she mentioned at the co-op where you can talk with people who know what they're looking at. And that's a good place to start if you have questions. Just go to where the product is and ask people around, what is this elderberry syrup? Can you tell me about it? Can you tell me different things? And um, you'll find folks who know and who can tell you if you have questions, but part of the due diligence in learning is to go and find those knowledge keepers around you. you know? yeah. Yeah. Um, we also have, um, I don't want to massacre her name. Is it Carissa or Caressa? Okay, so she stated on the thing that she just really likes to support tribal food sovereignty initiatives, and she put up two links. So we're going to be sharing those two links in the group, okay? Because we, we believe in the same thing, too. Tribal food sovereignty, native businesses helping, you know, indigenous economy and helping promoting native, uh, you know, just native everything, honestly. Very native-centric on this, on this uh, group. I think Desiree can confirm that, that we're very Native-centric. <laughs> yeah, we're so uh, Native-centric. That's my cousin, Carissa. <laughs> <The> <laughs> oh, my God. See, look at that. Everybody <laughs> knows each other. Carissa is, is Desiree's cousin. We got you, Carissa. We got you. Okay, so then, Michael, I apologize. I have missed much of this conversation. I have heard teachings that tea should be consumed weak steeped for five minutes or so. Have you heard this? What could be the reason? Um, I'd say it just depends on um, what it is that you're making. Um, 
and how strong you're trying to make it, how much water um, you're using. It, it all really depends on what kind of plant that you're using. Um, trying to think of an example. Um, yeah, I, I, all I've heard is for very natural teas um, is you boil it longer because it takes longer to extract um, those oils and things inside. But um, I'm not sure what the reason could be for that. It just probably just really depends on, on whose teachings that is and then um, what they're making. I wouldn't say that they're wrong necessarily. Um, because that's the way that they were taught and that's the knowledge that they are giving. Um, and I couldn't really say without knowing uh, what the conversation was and what medicine they're using and what exactly they're trying to use it for because it also depends. Yeah, so it seems like I don't know if that answers it well. <laughs> it seems like much of it is about you develop a relationship with the plants and you learn about <laughs> that you need. So it's probably best to start off weak. And as you develop a relationship, learn what it is that's developing in your relationship with whatever the plant is that you're seeking help from. Because you, you know, part of it is you need to talk to those plants and ask them, be in relationship and say, I'm asking you for this help. We heard Emma talk earlier about making sure that when you go out and you gather or you forage, you have things that you bring with you to give back, to, to acknowledge the relationship that you're not just going to be taking, you're also going to be giving as part of your presence and being back in the natural order. So I would start, you know, weak. I don't know a lot of things, about, but I know, you know, if you're approaching it, Maybe don't make yourself some cedar tea that's like you can't swallow it because it's just so strong. You know, maybe make one that's weak and then and then learn through through it, you know. Emma, is that something you would agree with? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that definitely. Um because I've grown up with um the different teas and the different medicine, I definitely um adjusted to the taste um but it, at first it can be really strong and don't force it down <laughs> if it's that strong um there are definitely other ways to do it or just make it lighter or adding sweeteners or watering it down um but don't try to make yourself drink something that's way too strong for you um, just going to mention this and, and maybe we should open it up so everybody can kind of chime in and talk, but um, plants, every plant is different. So just listening to Emma and Desiree on understanding the plant and developing a relationship, but even the plant, whether it's the stem, the roots, the bark, or the, the twigs, each of those parts also have a, a different relationship. So usually for more woodsy types of teas it's harder to extract if you just steep um or some some leaves are very fibrous so you want to really it just comes back to developing a relationship and understanding the plant as a whole and understanding that where you're at with the soil uh sometimes soil unfortunately is contaminated um, so understanding that too, understanding the environment, understanding the plant, understanding the cultural bears, just back to that. And I just wanted to let you guys know that and also probably open it up because I know that there's like a lot of comments on the chat. You guys can just talk. So I'm going to go ahead and um, I guess share the panel information for next week as we wrap up. So our panel, the way that First Foods is laid out is that every fourth class is a panel that brings back some or all of the instructors that you've seen from the weeks before to talk about, um, well, this week it's understanding our relationship with the land. And it's hosted by Unchi that's uh, 
grandma in Lakota, Unchi Kristenia Iala. She's a grandmother in occupied Arapaho territory where I live, who is going to be hosting it and leading us through a panel uh, it, about understanding our relationship with the land. Um, so the registration link is there at the bottom. It's bit.ly slash first foods for and the same way that you registered for this week's class is going to be the same for this panel. But after this, we're moving to a way to register for all of the classes. So if you want to have it be a standing time on your calendar, you can register one time and then be registered for June and July so that you don't have to always register, register, register for the ones that you have. And it also just makes it easier for us to email everybody. Your links won't change, you know, that sort of thing. We can send you uh, class materials a little more easily this way. So I just wanted to let you know, we are gonna change how you register, but for this last panel, you do have to register individually. So just a heads up that that's changing. Um, we'll be sharing information in the group about our host, Kristenia Yala, and about the past panelists all in the same post so that you can read it um, and see what it is that's gonna be discussed and, and what we could maybe learn from these first foods programs. So I just wanna say thank you to Emma and um, just give you the, the spotlight one more time to uh, wrap up and then Brooke will close us out. Okay. Emma, we'll see you later. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm really thankful for everything that you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Folks yeah. are saying thank you, Miigwech. They're impressed with you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close. Thank you to our sponsor, Ibex Puppetry, for the support to make First Foods happen. We've got an amazing community that continues to come to these classes. And just thank you so much.